Well, I'm honored to be at Q2B for the seventh year in a row. And since the theme this year is the roadmap to quantum value, I'll begin by reiterating a comment I've made in my previous appearances here. As best we currently understand, the path to quantum value is along the road to fault-tolerant quantum computing. And that has daunting implications for our field and for the quantum industry. We are in the NISC era, and NISC computing has value now scientifically. But as of now, there's no proposed application of NISC computing with commercial value for which quantum advantage has been demonstrated when we compare to the best classical hardware running the best algorithms for solving the same problems. Nor do we have at present persuasive theoretical arguments indicating that commercially viable applications will be found that do not use quantum error correcting codes and fault tolerant quantum computing. A useful survey recently appeared on the archive of quantum computing applications. It's over 300 pages long and includes rough estimates of the resources needed to run a number of quantum algorithms. And it's not the last word on the subject, of course. New applications are continually proposed and better implementations of existing algorithms continually appear. But it's a useful snapshot of our current understanding. And it's sobering. There may be quantum speedups for problems in optimization, finance, and machine learning. But generally, those quantum speedups are at best quadratic, meaning that the quantum runtime scales like the square root of the classical runtime. So quantum advantage kicks in only for very large problem instances and correspondingly deep circuits. We need quantum error correction to run those circuits. Applications to chemistry and materials may be more promising. We can envision large polynomial speedups or perhaps super polynomial speedups. But for those applications, we'll need at least hundreds of very high quality logical qubits. And we might have to run circuits with hundreds of millions of logical gates with very high fidelity. And quantum fault tolerance will be needed to run applications like those. And that has a high cost in the number of physical qubits that we need and the number of gates that we need to execute. And we should keep in mind that speed is also important. We're going to care eventually about the runtime on a wall clock for running an application solving a problem of interest. Now, we have noise in our quantum processors today and some ways of dealing with that noise, in particular quantum, irrigation, uh, quantum error mitigation methods like zero noise extrapolation and probabilistic error cancellation. And those are effective in current processors. But asymptotically, the cost of these error mitigation methods scales exponentially with the size of the circuit that we wish to execute. So error mitigation alone isn't likely to carry us to quantum value. Quantum error correction, on the other hand, has a much more favorable overhead cost, scaling like a power of a logarithm of the size of the circuit that we want to execute. But quantum error correction isn't effective now in running applications. What we'll need to make it effective are better two qubit gate fidelities and many more physical qubits and the ability to control those very large systems. We'll also want fast gates, mid-circuit readout, feed forward, qubit reset, and so on, a number of technical challenges that we need to face. Now, to get a feel for how the overhead cost of fault tolerance goes, consider the surface code, which is still perhaps our most promising path to relatively near-term implementations of quantum error correction because it has a relatively high threshold of accuracy and requires only geometrically local processing in a two-dimensional layout. Um, in the surface code, once the error rate for two qubit gates is below a threshold of accuracy of about 1%, the probability of a logical error per error correction cycle decays exponentially as we increase the distance of the code. 
and the number of qubits in the code block goes like the distance squared. So let's say that I can achieve uh, an error rate for two qubit gate of 10 to the minus 3, which is better than we currently see in multi-qubit devices. And let's say I want to run a circuit with 1,000 logical qubits with a number of time steps like 100 million. Then I would like a probability of a logical error per time step um, to be about 10 to the minus 11 per logical qubit. So we can read off from the formula that would mean a distance of 19 or 361 physical qubits per logical qubit. And then we would need a comparable number of ancilla qubits for reading out error syndromes. So over 700 physical qubits per uh, logical qubit, nearly a million physical qubits to run that circuit. Maybe someday we'll reach a error rate for two qubit physical gates at the 10 to the minus 4 level. And that reduces the cost, but we'd still need hundreds of thousands of physical qubits to run that circuit. Now, the quest for quantum error correction is gaining momentum, and I want to highlight a few developments that potentially are bringing us closer to the fault-tolerant era. So I'll mention erasure conversion, bias noise, and the discovery of more efficient codes. Let's start with erasure conversion. If we know where the errors occur in a quantum circuit, if we know which qubits are effective and in which time steps, that makes the errors easier to correct. What we call such located errors or heralded errors in the circuit erasure errors. And erasure conversion means engineering our processor so that the dominant errors are these erasure errors that are easier to correct. You can get a feel for the idea if you think about a bit which is protected by the repetition code. And then we can decode that bit successfully using majority voting if fewer than half of the bits are damaged. But if the er errors are heralded and we know which of the bits are damaged, we can look at any one of the undamaged bits to decode, which is much easier. In quantum codes, the story is a little more complicated, but the concept still applies. If we know where the errors are, we can correct them more effectively. One way to make use of that idea is if the dominant errors in our processor actually exit the computational space of the qubit. So the errors can be detected without disturbing the coherence of the undamaged qubits. One setting in which that's possible is alkaline earth Rydberg atoms. Now, the qubits are encoded in single atoms, where the state 0 corresponds to some low energy state of the atom, and the state 1 is a highly excited state. And the dominant error mechanism is the spontaneous decay of that excited state. But if the level structure of the atom allows it, that dominant error can take the state 1 not to 0, but to some other state g. And then if we check whether g is occupied or not, we can detect whether an error occurred or not without disturbing the coherence of a superposition of a 0 and a 1. Another way to realize the idea of erasure conversion in superconducting circuits is to use a dual rail encoding of a qubit in a pair of transmons or a pair of microwave resonators. The two states of the qubit could be realized, if I have two resonators, say, by putting a single photon in either one of those two resonators. The dominant error mechanism is the loss of a photon from the resonator, and that will take either the 0, 1, or 1, 0 state to 0, 0. So if I can check whether the state is 0, 0, I can determine whether an error occurred without necessarily spoiling the coherence of a superposition of 0, 1, and 1, 0. And demonstrations of this erasure conversion idea have been accomplished in the last few months using both atomic qubits and superconducting qubits. Another important idea is bias noise. In some cases, we could take advantage of the structure of the noise to improve the performance of quantum error correction. In some settings, for physical reasons, the bit flips are very highly suppressed, and therefore the phase errors dominate, and we can focus our error correcting power on those more frequent phase flips. Remember. Quantum error correction is harder than classical error correction because we have more errors to worry about. 
there could be a bit flip in the computational basis or a flip in the complementary basis, what we call a phase error. And if the phase errors dominate, we call that highly biased noise, and we can take advantage of that. In order to take advantage of that, though, we need to have the feature that errors that occur while we're executing gates do not result in bit flip errors. And it was just realized a few years ago that that's possible. We can have bias preserving gates if we encode the qubit in a continuous variable system like a microwave resonator. So one way of doing that is with the so-called cat code, named in honor of Schrodinger's cat, where the basis states of a qubit are two coherent states. The 0 and 1 are coherent states that are widely separated in phase space. And that strongly suppresses the bit flips in which a 0 becomes a 1 or a 1 becomes a 0. In fact, the bit flips become suppressed exponentially as we increase the mean photon number in the resonator. The dominant error, then, is the loss of a photon. That results in a phase error on the cat qubit. But the phase error rate increases only linearly with the mean photon number. So we can correct that with a classical code like the repetition code. And work on these cat qubits is ongoing. And we can expect to hear more about the progress in the next couple of months. It's also exciting that recently, new codes have been discovered that are far more efficient than the surface code. These include codes which have a constant rate, meaning the number of protected qubits in the code block scales, uh, scales linearly with the number of physical qubits in the block, as opposed to the surface code, where we have just a single protected qubit per code block. And some of these codes also have constant relative distance. That is, the distance, a rough measure of how many errors can be corrected, scales linearly with the uh, number of physical qubits in contrast to the surface code, where the distance goes like the square root of the uh, size of the code block. We know that these constant rate codes can have relatively high error thresholds, and they can be efficiently decoded. Schemes for executing fault-tolerant logical gates with these codes are still being developed, but they look promising. The catch, though, is that for these constant rate codes, in order to extract the error syndrome, as we need to do in each cycle of error correction, gates which are geometrically non-local in two dimensions are required. That geometric non-locality could be achieved by moving qubits around in an atomic platform or using the native long-range gates in an ion trap, or we might be able to engineer long-range couplings in a superconducting circuit as well. As an example, a recently discovered code with 144 logical qubits and distance 12 has 12 protected logical qubits. In contrast, there's a surface code with the same number of physical qubits and distance 12, but with just a single logical qubit. So that's a significant improvement in coding efficiency. The quest for error correction is providing numerous examples of co-design, where we're adapting the coding scheme that we use to the features of the hardware that we can build. But also, ideas from coding theory are driving the emergence of hardware with new capabilities. And that fruitful trade-off, or back and forth, is uh, likely to continue as we go forward. In this year's hardware news, it's a particularly exciting time now for Rydberg Atom Arrays. And we might expect that that platform will lead the progress in quantum error correction for the next few years if, as we hope, the two qubit gate fidelities can continue to improve. And these platforms, it's possible to control thousands of qubits. And reconfiguration of atoms trapped in optical tweezers enables the geometrically non-local non operations that we need to realize more efficient codes. And we'll hear tomorrow from Vlad and Vulatik about the current status of uh, this platform. In fact, there's a paper appearing today from the Harvard-MIT group that reports on some exciting progress. And by combining with 
erasure conversion, we might get even better error correction performance. But there are important caveats. Repeated syndrome measurement has not yet been demonstrated in these Rydberg platforms. For that, it'll be necessary to develop continuous loading of fresh atoms. And the atomic movement and the readout are relatively slow, which slows down the clock speed in this type of architecture. So in the near term, schemes in which we can move atomic qubits, as in uh, Rydberg atom platforms, will have advantages for realizing quantum error correction. In the long run, though, movement does impose serious limitations on clock speed. Uh, the current state of things is that if we rapidly accelerate an atom in an optical tweezer, it shakes loose from the tweezer. Or if we rapidly accelerate a ion that's uh, moving in a trap, its motional state gets substantially heated. So if we really want to use these um, platforms in which we can do geometrically non-local operations for quantum value using error correction, we're going to have to improve the clock speed by a lot. Now, to be fair, other platforms also face serious threats. In the case of superconducting qubits, one such threat comes from cosmic rays. Occasionally, a cosmic ray muon will deposit a lot of energy in a superconducting chip. That creates many phonons. The phonons break Cooper pairs, and that results in errors in many of the superconducting qubits in a large region of the chip. More errors, perhaps, than error-correcting codes can overcome. So what's the solution? Well, we could operate a quantum computer deep underground to reduce the muon flux, but that's expensive and inconvenient. We could use coding schemes in which we can tolerate errors which cause a whole surface code block to fail. That will increase the overhead cost of quantum error correction. Or maybe we can figure out how to harden a superconducting processor against ionizing radiation. But we don't really know how to do that right now. So as has been the case for years, our field in the quantum industry faces several big questions. One is, what are the useful things we'll be able to do with the quantum computers that we're developing? And another is, how are we going to scale up to quantum computing systems that can really solve hard problems? And the honest answer is, we just don't know yet. So it continues to be important to develop a number of different hardware approaches in parallel. Whatever turns out to be the leading technology, say, over the next 10 years, won't necessarily be the best answer in the long run. So this quest for fault-tolerant quantum computing is a long one. It will be gradual. Um, but we should have our eyes open to the fact that to attain quantum value, we're going to need to follow the road to fault tolerance. And that knowledge should inform our thinking, our strategy, and our investment now and on into the future. Thanks a lot for listening. <laughs> do we have time for a question? We do have some time for questions. Uh, let's see the QR code up on the screen. And then please take out your phones uh -huh. and point them to the, uh, to the QR code. And then you can type in a question. And we'll see, it, uh, we'll see it here. So I know it's a little bit. Uh, of a process, but if someone does want to answer a question, I think we have time for maybe one or two. Uh, let's hang tight here for a second. You better hurry up, because I'm going to take a slug of the scotch, and then I won't be able to give a good answer. <laughs> So, so we do have some questions coming in, uh, so maybe we'll take uh, two of them. Um, so let's go with this first one. Is it your opinion that quantum value is unlikely in NISC? So the question is, is it my opinion that quantum value is unlikely in NISC? Um, well, I don't know for sure. And as I've been saying for some years, I think it's really important while continuing to pursue the goal of fault-tolerant quantum computing to learn from the processors that uh, we can build 
now and steadily improve. But as I said at the beginning of the talk, I don't think we have persuasive evidence that we'll be able to run commercial applications that um, are valuable to users before we have quantum error correction to protect those circuits. Okay, let, maybe let's take one more. Um, and, and I know we have a ton of questions coming in, so we're not gonna be able to get to all of them. John is gonna be I'll here. be around if yeah. you wanna yeah. chat later. But let's maybe take one more. And um, so one of these questions that came in is, what are the best methods for generating new quantum error correcting codes? So what are the best methods for generating new quantum error correcting codes? Um, well, uh, how, how are these new codes discovered? Actually, they made use of um, a lot of clever mathematical ideas, which I guess I can't really uh, do justice to. But um, it draws on some ideas from uh, classical uh, error correction, some ideas about uh, graphs, ideas about things called um, expanders, um, and bringing all these mathematical ideas, which has really been seriously pursued, I think, by the quantum community only in the last few years, has, has so far been fruitful and I think will continue to be.